don't need that. Nobody needs that photo up there. We'll just move on. Hi, everybody. Thanks for welcoming me. Thanks for welcoming me to Creative Mornings. We'll get set up here a little bit. This is my first Creative Morning. I didn't know about you guys, but I'm going to start doing this from now on. Um, yeah, as Joel mentioned, um, he reached out to me. I wish I had a year to prepare for a theme like this because it's such an amazing theme for me personally. I think, you know, I mean, how many more universal themes can you come up with than the theme of death? Um, but it did seem like the perfect fit because the exhibition that we have downstairs that I curated, uh, Murder is Her Hobby, Francis Glessner Lee and the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death. I hope you all have had a few minutes to go down and check out that exhibition. Um, I just thought I would talk a little bit uh, extemporaneously about that and about the ho how the show came to be. Um, and just a little bit more broadly on the theme of death because it is something that I think, um, you know, there's so many amazing artists who do work in this genre a little bit. Um, but um, in particular, I think one of the questions that I get a lot about that show is how did this come to be? Um, and I think it was one of those shows that almost wasn't because I think some of the best ideas that I have as a curator are the shows that um, kind of nag me on the shoulder and you say, oh, I don't know that we could really do this. And those are the ones that um, really turn out as, uh, as we've discovered from hosting this show, which it's been phenomenal. Uh, so a couple of years ago, I was actually doing research on this artist. Uh, the work in front of you is by Rick Araluce. And if you've also been downstairs to see the other exhibition, The Final Stop, uh, Rick Arlus is the artist responsible for that piece. He's a scenic designer from Seattle, Washington, uh, but his main focus in his art is miniatures. And when you look at the pieces on the screen, you can see a little bit of the sort of variety of miniatures that he's produced over the years. On the left-hand side, one of the very small, sort of almost Joseph Cornell-like boxes. And there's definitely this larger narrative that goes on in his work, and a lot of it's very dark. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see a picture of his piece, The Longest Hours, which was uh, featured, it was actually made for an exhibition at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City. Um, this is an incredible piece. It's time-based. It's about uh, yay high, you know, about 18 inches tall. Um, and you have this incredible hallway that recedes into the distance. And there's a, a window at the end of the hall with a, uh, a lightning storm going on and all of the light bulbs are flickering. And so um, you can, you can sort of instantly begin to see the synergy that this has uh, with the work of Francis Glessner Lee. So I was doing a little re research on Rick's work um, and I went online and I googled something and I think this thing I was googling was I was looking for uh, a different artist that had something to do with it, Lori Nix, I think, um, and I googled creepy miniatures <laughs> and uh, I got something like this. And, uh, and this completely captivated me, as you can imagine. Uh, it seems like in the contemporary world, there are a number of artists who are doing miniature work that are kind of dystopian scenes. Um, but this stood out as being this really strange, anachronistic kind of a thing. Um, I rarely see work from, you know, this is the just post-war period that these pieces were made. And it's pretty obviously about 1940s or 50s. Um, and, and that was the time when the world was on the up and up. You know, we, we have this dystopian contemporary feeling, but you don't expect to see dead dolls in the mid-century. Um, so instantly I was captivated, as I think everybody who sees Francis Glessner Lee's work is, and I had to know a little bit more, and I started to read up about her work, and it got me really excited. Um, now I threw this in here uh, for fair warning because I thought I would talk a little bit about some of my favorite artworks uh, that are a little bit associated with death since I have this wonderful big broad topic to talk about. Um, and uh, this is a piece by an artist named Joel Peter Witkin. He's a, a photographer out of New Mexico. And uh, this is a piece that used to hang in my living, in my kitchen actually. So you can see, um, I have a little bit of a morbid side. I have a little bit of, you know, a goth period. I listened to The Cure when I was in high school. So, um, 
I started to think about putting Francis Glessner Lee in the museum, and I had real doubts about, you know, is this something that's appropriate for the Smithsonian? Can I get away with this? And so I started to mull over all of those things. But in the meantime, I started to look at some of the other works, um, and I thought I would show you a few other works that were sort of more in the vein of what we do here at Renwick, uh, some craft work that has also to do with the theme of death. Um, this is another favorite artist of mine. Uh, this is Dirk Stashke, and uh, Dirk is a ceramic artist, and he's been creating these pieces that are uh, largely to do with, you know, Dutch vanitas of the 17th century, but he's creating these in three dimensions, entirely in ceramic. Um, so the work is sort of outstanding visually, and it's really an interesting commentary on the sort of wealth and opulence and the, uh, and the, the real world and the illusion of that, and then the idea, of course, in Dutch Vanitas is live today for tomorrow we may die. So you, you're able to see this piece sort of in the round where you see the illusion of this grandeur, and then you go to the back side of it, and you see how it's created. And so I always find that, um, particularly with craft work, it's such an amazing metaphor um, for these ideas of mortality. You know, ceramic in general is uh, this thing that can last forever, but it's also incredibly fragile. So kind of wonderful work. And, and Dirk Stashke is part of our permanent collection. This is some of the work he's been doing more recently. And here's a piece that you can see right in our galleries in the other room, another artist that I love uh, named uh, Dan Webb, uh, and he's a wood carver. And you see on the right of the screen uh, Jacques-Louis David's uh, Death of Marat, which was one of the sources that, uh, that Dan was looking at when he created this piece. Um, but it's an entire series, and I think what this gets to for me is um, Dan started to create this piece which is essentially about the sort of death, but at the same time it's about uh, his children and he started this series of work uh, when, his, when his youngest child was born and he started to think about the idea of uh, the way that we are, this big block of raw material when we're born and then we carve ourselves out of that material and become something else and we're always attached to the beginning um, but uh, we never quite get away from it. We can't go back into it either. So um, kind of a wonderful idea of this sort of cyclical nature of life and death. And so I liked the idea that there was something really um, resilient about that. And then here's another artist uh, who I love, who I included in a show at uh, my previous museum, Bellevue Arts Museum, a few years ago. And uh, this is Motoi Yamamoto, and so this is sort of a different side, again, of this, this thematic notion of death. Uh, he started to create these labyrinths, and they're made entirely of salt. And he takes about a week or so working, you know, 10-hour days um, just sitting and, and funneling out these beautiful pathways of salt until he's created an entire room full of these. And he started this work uh, well after his sister had died of brain cancer. And so he was sort of dealing with that idea of death. Uh, in Japanese culture, he's a Japanese artist. In Japanese culture, death, uh, salt is a symbol of death and purification. Uh, and so it was sort of coming back to that. And so again, it was something that I really was interested in this idea of, of death as, as a way to think about renewal as well. So coming back to the nutshell studies, I had all these things on my mind and for about two weeks I sat on this and I was trying to think, how does this fit into the Renwick Gallery. Uh, these pieces had only ever been seen in the context of forensic science before, um, but I started to read up on Francis Glessner Lee's story, and it was just so compelling as a story about craft and um, the idea that this woman had co-opted, essentially, women's work, a, a, a woman's uh, women's processes to, to break into a man's world. And that was really wonderful. And I thought, you know, in the contemporary world, um, are these really too gruesome to show at a museum like this when we look at things like the CSI shows that we have on television today? Um, and so I came in on a Monday morning very excited, came to my colleague Nicholas Bell. He used to call these my morning thoughts. So I'd spend the whole weekend thinking about something and I'd come in and I'd say, all these things are going to happen and this is, 
this is fantastic and we need to do this about one idea in you know 20 that you say out loud ends up becoming something but it's always those very strange ideas so this is the story that I started to tell to Nicholas. Um, this is a picture of Frances Glessner Lee. She's in the lower right hand corner. Um, and Frances grew up in this incredible sort of fortress-like home in Chicago. Um, if any of you are familiar, this is now a museum. It's called Glessner House. Um, uh, it was built when she was about 10 years old. Um, and she is the daughter of, uh, of John Glessner and Frances Macbeth Glessner up there on the top. Um, and John Glessner was one of the founders of the International, Harvest, International Harvester, so uh, she was the heiress to that fortune. She was born in 1878. Um, having, having sort of grown up in this very you know, private, fortress-like home, and she and her brother were uh, homeschooled, you can imagine that she had a little bit of a sheltered existence. Uh, but she dreamed of bigger things. She dreamed of getting outside of that world. And even as a young girl, she was incredibly interested in reading medical texts, and uh, she wanted to be a doctor or a nurse. And she also had this curious fascination with murder and mystery. She, as you can imagine, in uh, about 1890 was when Sherlock Holmes first came out. Um, and I also was interested in the idea that uh, our first American serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes, if any of you have had the opportunity to read uh, Devil in the White City, was about the case of H.H. H. Holmes, great book. Um, well, he was uh, killing people in Chicago right about that time period, and it was mostly young ladies. They, they know that he killed about 27. They think he killed up to 200 people. So here's Frances, this young society lady who is incredibly interested in these ideas of death and medical science and all of those things, and her head is filled with getting outside of the home and getting outside of her small society existence. Um, and, and hearing about all of these sort of morbid ideas must have been incredibly fascinating to her. Uh, Frances' brother went away to Harvard, and uh, Frances wished that she could do the same, but instead uh, came, stayed home. Her parents sort of disapproved of that idea and pushed her into more feminine pastimes. And at 19, she met two of the most influential men uh, that would enter into her life. And those were Blewett Lee and George Burgess McGrath, which you see here. Uh, Blewett Lee she fell in love with at 19, and the two of them got married, and she began her expected life to be a wife and mother and sort of philanthropic heiress as she was brought up to be. George Burgess McGrath, uh, this is a picture of him when he was a little bit older, but uh, George Burgess McGrath was sort of the idea of her dream. She met him when he was nine, when she was 19. Her brother brought him home from Harvard. He was studying pathology. Her brother was studying uh, to be an attorney, and, and there was this conversation that would go on about the intersection of medicine and, and legal studies. Uh, and so she would later go on to marry Blewett, as I mentioned, uh, but scandalously get divorced after only a few years. And then in the 1920s, she reconnected with George Burgess McGrath, uh, who became one of the most influential figures in her life. Um, he's sort of a character. You could just sort of see it in him. He was known for telling these wonderful stories, and he was involved in about 27 or 21,000 cases during the course of his uh, time as the medical examiner in Boston. Uh, and he would, he would bring these cases to Francis, and the two of them would talk about them, um, and, and she would offer her own insights. And so she started to get very involved in police work around that time, which is something that her parents uh, heavily dissuaded her from. So back to the theme of death again. In, uh, in 1929, uh, she started to experience a, a large spate of deaths in her life. Her, her brother, who was only uh, about 58 years old at the time, her brother George, uh, passed away in 1929. And uh, in, in his honor, she ended up leaving a large sum of money to Harvard University. 
A few years later, her mother died, her, her daughter died just after that, and her father in 1936, and then finally her friend George Burgess McGrath in 1938. And that was really the thing that started her down that path. Uh, all of a sudden she had her inheritance, she had her freedom, um, and she probably had a whole lot of sadness over all of these people who had disappeared out of her life. Um, and so instantly she went to work at sort of memorializing those people at the same time as finally living her life for the first time. Um, here's a picture of Frances at Harvard University um, with the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death. Uh, so Frances endowed the School of Police Science at Harvard. It was the first school of its kind in the country. It was dedicated to her brother and to George Burgess McGrath, and it combined their two sort of joint interests of legal, medicine, of legal studies and medicine. Uh, and George Burgess McGrath had sort of given her uh, a couple of, of concerns with the field of forensics at that time period, which was really a very young field. Uh, his first concern was that in this country, largely we had a coroner system, and he was one of the first medical examiners. Now, for those of you who don't know the difference between a coroner and a medical examiner, uh, a coroner is an elected official, um, and so it was often a person who didn't really know anything at all about uh, about methods of death versus a medical examiner who had to be a trained medical professional. Um, so Francis's first concern was making sure that we tried to institute a medical examiner system throughout the country and that was the purpose of the program that she put in place at Harvard. Uh, the second concern that George Burgess McGrath had was that most of the time when people showed up at a crime scene uh, they really didn't know what they were doing and they would uh, contaminate the evidence, move the body, touch the cigarettes, anything that you could imagine that you didn't want people to do, they would show up and they did. And that was a harder thing because you didn't have any real method for training people um, how to approach a crime scene the first time. Uh, and so the nutshell studies were her response to that question. Uh, she came up with this ingenious idea that she could create a room full of tiny little complex cases uh, that could be used for training purposes. Uh, so, you know, there wasn't always a fresh dead body on the scene, but there was always a nutshell study that could be had. And here are a couple of the studies that Frances created. Uh, she worked with her carpenter, Ralph Mosher, and uh, between the two of them, they created 20 of these studies, all told. Uh, this picture is, uh, is a picture of Burnt Cabin, one of the pieces that's downstairs. We have actually 19 of the studies here in the museum. Uh, the 20th was destroyed in 1966 when it moved from Harvard to the Baltimore Medical Examiner's Office. Um, and what I really love about these pieces is that it is, you know, just after death, but Francis is actually memorializing that death forever. And, and so we have this opportunity to get into that person's life and really look at all of the details. So in this case, uh, this, the scene has occurred. Uh, there was a fire in this cabin. It was sort of a, a shanty cabin, although the, the gentleman I understand who was burned up was rather a wealthy gentleman. Um, and he was uh, there with his, with his nephew, and the nephew seemed to have gotten out alive. Um, and Daniel Perkins is missing and presumed dead. There's actually a, a corpse over in that bed burned up, but we have no idea whether that is Daniel Perkins or not. Um, Francis created these scenes as composites of real cases. Uh, so some of these scenes are, come from cases that we know, some of them come from cases that we don't know, um, and uh, some of these cases were never solved, which is pretty fascinating in and of itself. Um, this is actually another one of the scenes downstairs, and I know a lot of people always want to know um, the answers to all of these, all of these murder mysteries. Um, the answers are actually held under lock and key, so uh, these, these pieces are still used for training purposes today. But this is one that I will give you a little clue on, because that picture in the upper right hand corner there um, is actually a picture of the person who was the perpetrator in the case that this piece came from. 
Um, this was a, a case that we're pretty sure came from a murder um, of a girl named Constance Ship, and she was, she was killed by a classmate of hers. So looking back at, at some of Francis's work in, in sort of context, the closest context that you can find is probably the work of Narcissa Thorne, uh, who was another miniature, miniaturist. Um, you might recognize her work from the Art Institute of Chicago, the Thorne Rooms that are there, which is the largest body of her work. Um, and in the upper left-hand corner here, you see one of Narcissa Thorne's pieces. They were all pretty much period rooms, um, which at that time period were really all the rage all across the country to create these perfect miniature scenes, but they're all devoid of people. They're all these perfect, austere, beautiful rooms. And when I look at that in combination with Francis's work, I just can't, um, I love how much life is in what Francis is doing, despite the fact that it's a dead body. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's so much of a story here to be had, and that's so wonderful. Um, Francis and Narcissa Thorne were actually neighbors, next door neighbors in Chicago, and Narcissa Thorne was working maybe 10 years earlier, so you can imagine that this might have been where Francis got some of that idea. And sort of similarly to Francis, uh, Narcissa Thorne's husband had died very early, and so uh, I understand from her family that a lot of the reason that she did this work was she just wanted something that could keep her occupied, something that she could do with her hands. Um, and so I think that's sort of a, another layer to the question about the deaths in these scenes, that they're actually helping the people that are still alive to sort of cope with the life that they're living. And that idea of, of making as a sort of dramatic response uh, to death. Uh, this is a, a, an image of Alan Moritz, who was the head of the Harvard program, uh, and you can see next to Alan the uh, one of Francis's scenes. This is the barn, uh, and this was the first piece that Francis created, and this was a, a based directly on a case from George Burgess McGrath. Uh, Francis liked to hide, liked to sort of disguise the origins of her pieces. So the original case of George Burgess McGrath's was about this gentleman, Evan Wallace, um, not his real name. Uh, and in, in the original case, this occurred in a basement of a home. Um, but this gentleman was sort of a hothead, and he would go out every day. He would have a, an argument with his wife, and he was a bit of a hothead, and so he would go out and he would threaten suicide and make her talk him down off this bucket. And on this particular day, uh, Eben went out into the barn, and the bucket was missing. The wife had been using the bucket on the side of the house, and so instead he stood up on this box. Um, and unfortunately, the box gave way under his feet. Now, there was an insurance policy involved with this case. Um, so the question that Francis wants to ask is, is this, is this murder? Is this suicide? Is this death of natural causes? Or is this an accident? Um, and with each of these pieces, it's very hard to tell what the actual case was, but you're invited to come in and explore each one of these deaths and look around the room for all of the cues, um, not only to the blood evidence and whatnot, but to the way that this person lived. So it really is an exploration of the mental and emotional state of the, of the you know, social status and everything it was about this person that's, that's memorialized there in this death. And as I mentioned, uh, Francis managed to uh, use these to break into a field that was entirely male-dominated, and I think this picture is the most incredible picture that says it all. She took a class photo every year uh, with the gentleman that she was teaching. She started her seminars in 1945 and taught them uh, pretty much up until her death in 1962. And there's Frances at the end of the table. Uh, the first one of these seminars that she taught in 1945, that was the same year that the first female enrollees were allowed into Harvard Medical School. So it's pretty remarkable that this old woman uh, managed to do this. I should sort of back up a little bit as well because, um, you know, these are sort of a quirky object. 
And a lot of people wonder whether she was taken seriously with these pieces. But in fact, uh, Frances, of her own doing, before she started the school at Harvard, also became part of her local police department uh, and ended up becoming the first female police captain in the country by 1943, um, teaching uh, educational seminars to police. But she, it was not an honorary position. She had a gun. She had a badge. She had arresting capability. Uh, made her own way in that regard. She was, however, far more seriously taken because she was a wealthy heiress with a lot of means. And so this is what I really love about Frances. This, this is uh, out at the Baltimore Medical Examiner's Office where most of these studies live today. And the studies, as I mentioned, are still being used today. Um, so, 70 years after this very elderly woman began making these pieces, she started these pieces when she was 65 years old, here they are being used, here she is still living on through her work and finally starting to be recognized by us, uh, by, by Hollywood, by so many other places. Uh, so she was uh, memorialized a few years ago in a, in a uh, documentary film of Dolls and Murder by Susan Marks. There's another one coming out shortly that we showed an advanced version of a few days ago. Um, she's been memorialized in, in CSI. She was the uh, model for, of murder she wrote, the Jessica Fletcher character. Uh, a lot of people sort of know about her in the ether, but um, these objects, these nutshell studies of unexplained death that she created um, were her ticket into immortality. So it's funny that, uh, that these little tiny death studies have actually brought her forward. Um, so yes, after all that time, I wanted to sort of move back and, and look at one more piece by one of my favorite uh, craft artists. Uh, and talk a little bit about that immortality. This is a piece by Tip Toland, who's another ceramic artist that I find incredible. This is a life-size work called Milk for the Butter Thief, and it's a portrait of this very old woman um, who is, uh, you know, in acceptance uh, of the idea of death, and, uh, and it's all about this sort of Buddhist ideal, and I think it's really interesting to me that a lot of these artists who deal with this topic um, are artists who are some of the most soft-spoken, beautiful, sort of loving, fulfilled folks, um, and then they deal, deal with these very dark topics each time. So, um, kind of interesting to me that when we're talking about death, it's really usually all about life. And that's also going to be true in the next exhibition that we hold here. Um, I couldn't help but reflect a little bit on the fact that our next exhibition, uh, which is going to be No Spectators, The Art of Burning Man, has that same cyclical sort of thing going on in it. Um, the idea, I was talking to some of the founders of Burning Man, and they, I said, well, why do you burn the man? And they said, so that we can build him again. And I thought that was a pretty beautiful idea. So. That's the talk.